Our next speaker is also no stranger to the stage, and uh, those of you that have been coming will have heard her on other occasions since she's back. This time, um, Kathy's here to talk to us uh, because one of the grand dams of Main Street is celebrating her 100th birthday this year. And so Kathy's going to come and talk to us about uh, the, Car the Carnegie Library on Main Street. Welcome, Kathy. Kathy. Well, just to be clear, I am not the grand dam. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. It's the story of Kenora's own Carnegie Library. In 1894, a number of prominent local citizens founded the Rat Portage Mechanics Institute and Art School with books from the original CPR library forming the base of their collection. In 1895, that would become the Rat Portage Public Library, followed by the change to the Kenora Public Library in 1905. It was in 1907 after the library petitioned town council to establish a free public library that Andrew Carnegie's name would first be mentioned. Andrew Carnegie was a Scottish-born immigrant to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Young Andrew began working as a messenger boy for the Pennsylvania Railroad and in record time advanced to the position of superintendent. He purchased his first stock in 1856 when he invested in the new railway sleeper cars. By 1865, he had organized the Keystone Bridge Company, and just eight years later, the Carnegie Steel Co Company. Within a few years, he would be one of the richest men in the United States, and in 1901, he sold his steel company, valued at $400 million, to J.P. Morgan. Although he was one of the wealthiest industrialists of his time, he's best known as a philanthropist. He spent the first 60 years of his life amassing a fortune. He spent the remainder of it giving it away. Carnegie said, a library outranks any other one thing a community can do to benefit its people. It's a never failing spring in the desert. He felt that anyone with the desire to learn could educate themselves and be successful in America. And that the knowledge needed to achieve that success could be gained from the public library. That belief inspired him to build 2,059 libraries worldwide. At the very first meeting of the Kenora Library Board, with Sheriff Humble as chair, one of the first orders of business was to approach Carnegie with an aim to establish a permanent home for the library, and this is the application that was submitted in March of 1907. Town, Kenora. Population, 6,159. Has it a library at present? Yes, it does. <coughs> Number of books, 3,904. Circulation for the past year, 8,436. How is the library housed? In rented premises, partly used as a store. Number and measurement of the rooms, 60 by 15, one large room. Cost of operating, I hate to say this. <laughs> Revenue, $928.50. $830.10. Rate and amount council will pledge for support annually, $7,000. Is the requisite site available? Yes. Amount now collected towards the building? That line was left blank. <laughs> along with this letter, or along with the application, a letter stating that Kenora, which was formerly Rat Portage, at the head of the Lake of the Woods, is an enjoying an unusual share of the prosperity of the West and is destined to become the largest flour milling center in Canada, having the largest water power in Canada next to Niagara. In addition to pledging operating funds, the town was required to provide 
the building site before any application would be approved. And despite what the information was, that was provided on the application, this did not seem to be the case. Regular library operations would continue, and in 1908, the library entered into an agreement with Mr. Charles Machen, wherein he would use the front of the library for his candy and fruit store, and at the same time, act as librarian. <laughs> and so it seems, began our library staff's long and lasting love affair with the candy business. <laughs> The arrangement must have worked well, though, because in 1909, when the library moved to new premises, Mr. Machen and his candy store relocated along with it. In 1911, Arthur Bevan was appointed librarian, and rent was being paid to him for the use of his store, still carrying on business in a candy store. It wouldn't be until 1913, when a suitable location had been found, that the town again approached the Carnegie Corporation for funding. Back in 1887, the municipality of Rat Portage had purchased the land and premises from the Governor and Company of Adventurers of England trading into Hudson's Bay. The property was in the village of Rat Portage and consisted of Lot 28 in Block 1, and it became the site of the local fire hall until January of 1912. Unfortunately, a fire that broke out in the early hours of January 18th of that year completely destroyed the fire hall. Council's decision in 1913 to provide this prime real estate for the new library did not meet with the agreement of everyone in Kenora. A letter in the Minor and News, People's Forum, dated April 21st, 1914, shows that some people had serious concerns regarding the location of the future library. <coughs> to the editor, I read with pleasure your article recite the proposed Carnegie Library, and while I am heartily in accord with the securing of this library, and also of the opinion that a good location for the same should be provided by the town, <coughs> I cannot agree with Mayor Brett and others that one of the most valuable pieces of property in town should be given away for a $15,000 building. The property across the road purchased a couple of years ago for City Hall purposes, I also consider too valuable. Why not go down Main Street South and place it on the park opposite the courthouse? It would help to improve the appearance of that part of the street. Yours truly, rate paper. Regardless of the opinions shared through the news, the property at 24 Main Street South was provided for the library and plans did proceed. What follows is a summary of more than four years of correspondence between G.C. Hay, who was the clerk of the town of Kenora, and Mr. James Bertram, who was the secretary of the Carnegie Corporation. Back in uh, May of 1913, Hay enclosed a letter to Bertram, along with a fresh application. His letter said, Council are now in a position to pro provide a very suitable site for one of Mr. Carnegie's libraries. At the present time, our library is in a store on Main Street, together with a candy store. The librarian is the owner of the candy store. We're desirous of obtaining for this corporation one of Mr. Carnegie's libraries. And I may say, for a population of 6,500 people, the present library is entirely inadequate. Bertram soon wrote back, setting out the requirements for the grant. If the city agrees by resolution of council to maintain a free public library at a cost of not less than $1,500 a year, and provides a suitable site for the building, Carnegie Corporation of New York will be glad to give $15,000 to erect a free public library building for Kenora. It should be noted, the amount indicated is to cover the cost of library building complete, ready for occupancy, and for the purpose intended. Before any expenditure on building, plan, <coughs> building or plans is incurred, the approval of the proposed plans by Carnegie of New York should be secured. To obtain which, please send sketches. 
In January of 1914, Mr. Hay wrote a very enthusiastic letter to Bertram extolling the virtues of the land for the future library. I may say, for your information, that the site in question is the most desirable one in town. Being in the very heart of the town, just opposite the post office building and fronting on the Lake of the Woods. A hint at the relationship that would develop between Carn Kenora and Carnegie Corporation emerges in 1914 with the following request from Mr. Hay. I'm happy to be able to advise you that I have the plans, will have the plans of the new library in hand in the very new future and they'll be submitted to you for approval in accordance with your instructions. In this connection, I may say, I've lately had a deputation from the library board and they have requested me to take up with you the possibility of a further grant from Mr. Carnegie of $5,000. In order to simplify matters, I enclose herewith for your consideration a sketch which sets out clearly the very excellent site for the new library. You will note that the site is in the heart of town and borders on the lakefront. The board points out that in order to do justice to the Carnegie Library and to the site itself, a suitable dock will have to be built. <laughs> Northern Harbor wouldn't have been nearly so many if they'd have got that grant. Uh, yeah, a suitable dock will have to be built as it's the intention to have a front to the lake as well as to the main street. In view of the fact that we have here between 600 and 700 motorboats, the owners of which have residence on nearby islands, and they would no doubt take this means of getting to the building. He also adds, I may say, the council had first decided to hold this property for park purposes but in view of Mr. Carnegie's gift, agreed to give the site in question. The town clerk goes on to say he'd be deeply grateful, grateful for a speedy response. He did indeed receive a quick response from Mr. Bertram, stating, it is considered the amount promised is sufficient to provide a library building, giving the needed facilities for the population of Kenora. This corporation does not see its way to add to that amount. Included with the letter was the corporation's pamphlet titled Notes on Library Buildings. I should mention that the architects designing the first of the Carnegie Libraries had a great deal of leeway in their designs. Although final approval for the plans always rested with the corporation, the early libraries weren't built to standardize plans. Some of them were pretty fancy. Over the years, Carnegie staff refined their process, placing more and more control over the communities and actively controlling the dis architectural design. After 1905, the Carnegie Corporation demanded standardized designs for the library buildings. Bertram had developed this pamphlet called Notes on Library Buildings, and it included six sets of acceptable plans um, and designs this standardization followed a basic formula. I have two levels with a lecture room, washrooms, a boiler and fuel room on one floor, and a reading room, a reference area, and space for a librarian on the other. The architect of Kenora's Carnegie Building was a Scotsman named John Manuel, who emigrated to Canada in 1912 and was working from Winnipeg at that time. When his plans were sent to Carnegie for approval, Bertram returned them, stating, better not to have cut up the basement into small areas, especially not to have made an lecture hall irregular, of a regular shape by taking off a chair store at one end and a retiring room at the other. I regret we cannot allow the balcony feature, which cuts off light from the building and would be a precedent for other cities for all sorts of extraneous additions to those buildings. Clerk Hay responded, your suggestions are carefully noted and it's with great regret that I know you don't favor the balcony feature. So I'm taking the liberty of again writing you in the matter. I may say the balcony feature was looked upon as a splendid idea in view of the characteristics of the site. 
as I advised you on a previous occasion. The site chosen for the Carnegie Library building is an excellent one. In fact, the most valuable one that could be obtained. Situated as it is, in the heart of the town, with frontage on Main Street, and the rear of the park property being Lake Frontage and a splendid view, it was felt that the rear entrance was just as important as the front, and so the architect was instructed to embody in his plans the balcony as shown on the blueprint, having always in view the necessity of light. I may say it's the intention to have the balcony suitably screened, properly lighted, in order to, that the members of the library may take their reading material and enjoy our splendid evenings. I should also point out the great number of motorboats we have here, the majority of whom are library members. <laughs> While I appreciate your stand in the matter and the precedent that might be set, I would ask that you give the site further consideration as we are most anxious to have the balcony, if at all possible. To drive home the point, he also includes a letter from the library board. I am informed that your board have taken exception to that part of the submitted plans embraced in the balcony overlooking the Lake of the Woods. While we bow in all due respect to the authority of the Carnegie Corporation in this matter, I would like to state briefly the position of the board. The site chosen is, to my mind, unequaled in every respect to any other that could be selected. And among the chief advantages is its location along the lake shore. Having this in mind, the board requested that the library make the architect make provisions for the balcony as, as it's a valuable addition to the reading room during the summer months. And I think it would be a great pity to deprive our people of this advantage. Their pleas were heard and Kenora did receive a rare, if somewhat grudging, concession in September of 1914 that allowed for the balcony feature. As per Carnegie's requirements, a resolution from council had been provided assuring that the building would be erected, complete, ready to occupy in accordance with the building plan as amended with the balcony feature, included at an expense within the sum of $15,000. It had been, has been reported that a number of early, in, early buildings did incorporate living quarters into their building for the librarian or for a caretaker. This was something that they reported Bertram would never have approved if he had known. While much of the correspondence refers to changes that they did make in the lecture hall by taking off the retiring room and the chair store room, there's never any mention again about the little areas being cut up on the, on the lower floor. So whether Bertram ever learned that Nora had included a caretaker's quarters in the lower level may never be known. Regardless, the quarters were there in the lower north end of the building and a caretaker hired before the library was due to open. In September of 1914, Mr. Fred Gilbert, the contractor with the winning tender of $14,200, had already begun digging out the basement of the old fire hall site. And by January of 1915, was, it was reported that the exterior work on the new library building is rapidly nearing completion, and workmen are at present engaged sheathing the roof with galvanized iron. The new library opened to the public on Thursday, August the 26th of 1915. This event will mark another epoch in the history of the town when this splendid new library, imposing in appearance, comfortable and suitable in the interior, will open its doors for the benefit of Kenora citizens. Unfortunately, it would be September of 1916 before library chairman J.W. Humble submitted the required exterior photos along with plans for both floors of the building showing everything just as it was at the time. He also provided a newsy report on the present librarian, Mrs. Bevan, one of, wife of one of the brave boys who served the country well on the battlefields of Belgium, an opinion on the local churches 
not wanting people educated, or in particular to be reading books from the public library, and a lengthy report on the activities of the Red Cross Society and their Field Comforts Committee. Bertram's response was a brisk request for the original plans as were approved. The board sent in the only plans they have, the contractor's blueprints, along with an explanation that the board had put in an office for the librarian, but that was only done after the building was finished. Bertram promptly let it be known that it was a violation of the agreement for any change to have been made without obtaining approval, stating that such procedure seems particularly ungracious in view of the fact, as you will remember, certain concessions were made in approving the plans with the bal balcony and veranda extension. The architect reported that only minor changes had been made, including the, uh, the removal of one staircase on the inside between two floors, and one on the balcony that had been removed. He also reported that a librarian's office was built, but that was done after completion of the contract. Mr. Humble passed this information on to Mr. Bertram and explained, if the library did wrong in erecting the little office, which is very nicely furnished, don't blame council. Throughout 1917, numerous requests for the submission of the approved plans was, were received and finally, in December, Mr. Humble penned a two-page letter explaining the original stamp plans can't be located anywhere. But the architect said, aside from those two changes, uh, as far as he can re recollect, they were followed in every way. When the contractor was asked about the cost of the changes, he said, couldn't remember offhand, but the cost, whatever it was, was deducted from the extras. Humble also added, I may say, we never thought of building a record in this country without some extras cropping up. And in this case, the $15,000 was not sufficient to complete the building, as there were extras to pay for. Also, the veranda should never have been built with stairs at all, as it created an issue with the loss of library materials. The library board had nothing to do with the building of the library, and you should deal with council. <laughs> a rapid response was received from Bertram pointing out the futility of going into details when it re what was required was the approved plans. Mr. Humble's explanation is irrelevant as the agreement was that the building would be built as per the amended plans within the promised budget and there was no latitude in that pledge. <coughs> Regarding his comments on extras cropping up, he was even less forgiving. If you will pardon me for saying so, in the face of your, the, your pledge, your statement shows a lack of a sense of responsibility. That was the last exchange for more than a year and a half, but another storm was coming, really. In September of 1919, the worst storm in the history of Kenora did heavy damage in the town. The large double veranda on the public library overlooking the lake was completely wrecked and two or three feet of the outer brickwork of the building next to the roof was torn out in the collapse of the veranda. J.E. Curry, the new clerk of the town of Kenora, wrote to Carnegie to let them know and asked, will you please advise us just how to proceed with this work? whether having the repairs made by day labor and the account sent to you, or tenders called and submitted for your approval. There should be no delay in having the damages stuck repaired. The response from Bertram, again, very quickly, your letter seems to reflect the assumption that this corporation not only provides funds for the erection of library buildings, but it keeps them in repair after erection. Curry's rejoinder are equally swift. While we understood that your corporation erected buildings for libraries and municipalities cared for the repairs, we did not assume that municipalities were to re-erect buildings 
after they were blown down. <laughs> Bertram's final opinion is directed to the mayor. In the name of the board of trustees of the Carnegie Corporation, I beg to send you their sympathy in connection with the loss sustained during the hurricane referred to by the town clerk in the enclosed letters. These letters are sent to you because of the mental attitude shown by your town clerk. <laughs> it is one thing to receive a request to give assistance. It's a different thing to be asked summarily how you wish to pay the bills. <laughs> Though the veranda roof was never repaired or replaced, I'm sure you'll all recall the balcony that stood until the 1992 renovations to our beautiful Carnegie building. Today, almost a hundred years later, we should look at our library and recognize the wonderful and generous, con generous contributions that Mr. Carnegie and his corporation made here. We must also be especially thankful for the foresight, innovation, and bold tenacity of the municipal leaders and library members of the day. They ensured the creation of a library for Kenora that would stand the test of time.